Um, so I'm going to start with Katie. Katie Ahern is this panel's moderator, and she is the director of the RW Law Business Startup Clinic. Katie leads the school's business startup clinic, which serves nonprofit and small business clients. Students in the clinic learn substantive business lawyering skills, work directly with clients, and interact with the Rhode Island nonprofit and small business community. Professor Hearn was previously an associate at Hinckley, Allen & Snyder, where her legal practice focused in all areas of federal, state, and local tax matters affecting businesses, individuals, governmental entities, and tax-exempt organizations. Katie also teaches business law-related classes at the University of Rhode Island. Um, the next person uh, not sitting next to Katie is Lisa. <laughs> Lisa Rayola is the president and founder of Hope in Maine. Rhode Island's first food business incubator, established to assist local entrepreneurs to jumpstart early stage food companies by providing low cost, low risk access to shared use commercial kitchens and other industry specific technical resources. Hope in Maine helps to grow the local food economy by creating a community, please shut off your cell phones, <laughs> of support <laughs> for food entrepreneurs and cultivating an environment where emerging culinary startups can test, create, scale, and thrive. Approaching its one-year anniversary, Hope in Maine has launched 50 businesses. In addition, Lisa is Vice President for Institutional Advancement at Roger Williams University, where she is responsible for fundraising for both the university and the law school, including major gifts, corporate and foundation relations, annual giving, and alumni parent relations. Next, we have Jessica David. Jessica is the Senior Vice President of Strategy and Community Investments for the Rhode Island Foundation. The Rhode Island Foundation is one of the nation's oldest and largest community foundations, Rhode Island's only community foundation, and the largest funder of Rhode Island's nonprofit sector. Jessica is responsible for the Rhode Island Foundation's strategy communications, evaluation and learning, grant programs, and economic security sector. Among projects she has led are the Rhode Island Innovation Fellowships, a program that develops, tests, and implements innovative ideas to improve any area of life in Rhode Island, Make It Happen RI, an effort in, in, initiated in 2012 to improve the state's economy, and the Civic Leadership Fund that enables the foundation to seize opportunities, meet emerging challenges, and continue its work as a connector and a convener. Finally, we have Phil Rosenthal. Phil Rosenthal is the president and co-founder of FastCase. Under Phil's leadership, FastCase has grown to one of the largest legal publishers in the world, serving two-thirds of the lawyers in the United States. FastCase also is the number one provider of online legal research benefits to bar associations around the country and has the most downloaded legal app according to the ABA. Phil combines his backgrounds in technology and law to bring lawyers and law librarians online legal research tools that are smarter and more intuitive. Before founding FastCase, Phil was an associate at Covington and Burling in Washington, D.C. His diverse legal practice encompassed nuclear, patent, telecommunications, environmental, and corporate law. Katie, take it away. Anyone else really impressed by the phrase, phrase nuclear patent? <laughs> All right, thank you again for inviting me to be a part of this. I think this is a really insightful and innovative way to dig into and brainstorm changes in your own industry, so I'm excited to be a part of it. Uh, for the first question, according to the book Collective Genius, The Art and Practice of Leading Innovation, quote, innovation is the creation of something both novel and useful, it can be large or small, incremental or breakthrough. It can be a new product, new service, new process, a new business model, a new way of organizing, or a new film made in a new way. To start, so to start us off, would each of you briefly describe what your organization does and then also share with us if there's anything that you would like to add to this definition of innovation? We wouldn't mind starting with Jessica and then oh. we'll actually do, we'll do Lisa last since she has a special treat to share with us. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, it's really exciting to be here, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, I think that's as good a definition as I've heard. Um, we actually, at the foundation, we have a program that has innovation in its name, so we've spent quite a bit of time 
trying to figure out what the definition of innovation is, and my um, summary is, of that is that everyone has a different one, and it's sort of like you know it when you see it. Um, and so I try not to spend too much time defining it beyond that. Um, I think for the, the, the foundation is actually sort of an interesting um, entity, I feel like, to be up here. We are turning 100 years old next year um, in 2016, and so we are a, a fairly um, traditional organization that's been around a long time, that for most of its life did things fairly traditionally, uh, and I, I would argue fairly conservatively, but don't tell anyone that. Um, and really, I would say over the past 10 years or so, five to 10 years, has, has sort of reinvented itself, um, and largely in response to community needs um, and demands from people like Lisa, who, who are really doing the on the ground work out in the community, um, and also our donors, who um, for a, a very long time, you know, we have, we have many generous donors who um, were very content to um, turn their money over to the foundation uh, and, and um, didn't really expect um, beyond that much in the way of you know, evaluation of results of communication, of ongoing um, tweaking and adapting of programs. Um, and we've really seen that shift over the last decade or so as um, there's generational shifts in philanthropy. So between, I would say, the community and our donor base, we've really been, I think, um, forced to change and to adapt. So we are, uh, our, our core areas of business are raising money, working with philanthropists, philanthropists, making grants and investments in the community and doing a lot of sort of leadership work um, in all of the spaces in between and, and including the public sector. And I think all of those areas have been influenced by this, this concept of um, innovation or transformation and has forced us to rethink um, how we're doing things. So I think we are sort of an interesting organization in that we're kind of on the, we're straddling the line a little bit in, in the, that we still do things in um, some traditional ways. Uh, and we are doing things in um, new and what feel like fairly innovative ways for the, for the philanthropic community. Um, so I think I'll stop there for that question. And the donor-driven innovation has really been an interesting thing to watch. So, wa so watching what is, I guess you consider part of your client or stakeholder base drive the innovation is a really neat uh, viewpoint. Unfortunately, lawyers are very familiar with I know it when, you, when I see it definitions. <laughs> uh, so we're going to skip over to Phil and then go to Lisa. Okay. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you so much for in inviting me. Uh, wish, wish I could stay the whole, whole day with you, but uh, we had th through lunch. First, I just had to ask, was, it, was there a toxic spill in that corner, side of the room? Is there, I, I um, why everyone is over, is over here. Uh, uh, also, as you know, I'm a lawyer, and finally I get to do something in a courtroom, so thank you. I'm there, you know, I never really uh, did that. So, so Fast Case, I think a lot of you have heard of us. We, we try to bring big data analytics to legal research, to make legal research beautiful, smarter, faster, easier. That's half of our mission. The other half is to democratize the law. And those two, of course, are in a lot of tension uh, and have created, have necessitated some innovations because how do you make it affordable and democratize it and, and yet have the funds to do interesting things? And, and so, um, it, you know, certainly working with the, the, the bar market and, and I have to say one, you know, where we started actually was with uh, Social Law Library, and, and that was what I think our, one of our biggest uh, uh, things was to move into, it doesn't have to be a bar, and to, and to start doing that kind of member benefit. And it really all started with uh, Robert in the, <laughs> in the back. Uh, so uh, always, always great to, to see him there. And so in terms of the definition, um, you know, I, I thought a lot of it, does it really have to be novel? May in some strict linguistic sense, an innovation almost by definition has to be, but I, I don't know. So first, perfect novelty is so rarely happens. You know, I think in my physics days, when, when there'd be a, even, even when there'd be some big breakthrough, you know, two or three groups might do it at the same time. Uh, it, it was just the time for, for that to happen. Um, maybe it could be done before, but it's in a slightly new circumstance. Uh, there's some aspect that's different. You know, is, is the idea of affordable legal research truly novel? I don't, I don't know. Or maybe the interface is a, a little different or a, a little cleaner. Um, sometimes I think even being second, you, you know, we weren't strictly the first to enter the bar market, but I think 
you know, applying it to our situation and the way we did it, maybe there was some, some novelty there. Uh, you know, discounts, that's not novel. Um, one of the things we, we did in certain circumstances was the 80% discount. Is that novel? I don't know. It's big. It's unusual. <laughs> um, so, so I think uh, applying a model that's out there, just moving it over, you know, I think sometimes people get scared away from innovation because, I, oh my gosh, am, am I, I can't be, be Steve Jobs. Well, I can't be Steve Jobs either. Not, uh, you know, no one is going to be that. But there are these things that seem so little you can do. You know, I see them using it over there. I'm going to bring it over here. And it makes a big difference. Is it novel enough? Is it innovation? I don't know. It makes a big difference. So let's do it. <laughs> so innovation is relative then to your relative. industry is a good takeaway. And it can be local. I sort of, it, you know, it might not be globally innovative, but it might be innovative in your little pond, and that makes it innovative. So That's a good point. Okay, so I'm going to go right to your video then, if that's okay. Sure, Katie, thanks. That's because my elevator speech <laughs> takes an 80-story building. <laughs> We have an incredible range of companies. We have people making pickles and tomato jam and cheesecakes and coconut butter and popcorn. Uh, I've been continually impressed with the range of businesses that we've been able to um, attract to Hope in Maine. And I'd like to say that when you see one food business, you've seen one because they are, they all have a different set of needs. Um, and the fun part of the, of the project is problem solving um, for all these different kinds of businesses from the kinds of equipment that they need to the kind of packaging that they need. Um, and it's been a wonderful learning experience, I think, not only for um, for the businesses, but also for Hope and Maine. With each new business, we're learning how we can be a better assistance to people. So, it, in the big picture, Hope and Maine is changing, um, is changing people's relationship to food. My own passion was to, um, was to be, was to get people in a conversation about um, their food and what they're putting in their bodies. I think that we've lost touch with the provenance of our food and it's something that we abdicated a hundred years ago when this when this building was built. The idea of local food um, would have been an anomaly. You, would have, you wouldn't even have understood the term because all of our food was local and it was very much the basis of our economy. We had a mercantile economy a hundred years ago and now our food can come from anywhere and many of us don't know where it comes from so um, the, the, at, at its core Hope and Maine is trying to change the conversation um, by um, and by locating in a school um, you know it's the perfect metaphor for, for education um, I want to educate people about um, the way in which food relates to the quality of your life which we've done very little to, it's still a classroom, um, so that we can invite the community into this conversation. Um, you, 
don't get an education by reading food labels uh, while you're walking through the, uh, the supermarket. Um, you, you understand food when you can interact with it and, and be part of a community that wants to be in that conversation and take back the local food system. So she did a better job than I could have done explaining what Hope for Maine is about. But uh, I also want to thank everyone for um, inviting me here today. I, I actually, in full disclosure, do not work at Hope in Maine. I was the founder of Hope in Maine, uh, and um, I work here at, at Roger Williams um, uh, and fundraise. And one of the things that um, that I uh, think is is sort of undervalued or under discussed is the is the ability for philanthropy to stimulate innovation because in, um, innovation can come from a place of um, desperation or or inspiration. And in some ways, without philanthropy, you, 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 you find yourself coming from that place of desperation. And so to have a, you know, a facility that gives you this, this, these wide margins of failure, actually, is a real luxury for startups. Um, and Katie's startup clinic and the students there have helped many, many of these companies to um, to form corporations, to think about intellectual property, to um, really to, to help them to jumpstart their businesses. And none of that would have happened um, without, um, without philanthropy. So it, it's, it's just such a wonderful um, tie-in. You do realize that was a mean video to show before lunch. But this is an <laughs> incredible organization, so I assure you it is worth it. They find really interesting ways to partner with others in the community. Uh, my clinic is one example to bring more to their audience. All right, so moving on to our next question. In what ways does your organization promote innovation, entrepreneurship, or creativity in the workplace? Anyone who wants to start? Um, you know, I think in some ways the biggest thing we do is try to get out of the way. <laughs> and what I mean by that is I, I think if you have smart, passionate people, they're, they're going to have creativity. And, and I think as a society and a lot of organizations, we do everything we can to make sure it doesn't happen. <laughs> and, and um, you know, I, I, just a, a few ex ex examples, and, and not, not, not just from us. You, you know, the classic I, uh, thing when they asked uh, Henry Ford about, you know, the automobile, and he said, look, if I, if I had, to put it in modern parlance, if I first had to do a focus group, <laughs> right, the, people would have said they want a better horse. And, and you're not going to get the, the wild departures if, and, and if you say, well, fantastic idea and let's, let's go through a two-year process to see if it actually, you'll, you'll, never, you'll never get there. So I think that's uh, a part of it. Um, I think part of it, it just, just you want top down to have everyone thinking of the interesting issues that are a core to whatever your mission is. Uh, it could be as simple as, you know, we, when, when, when interesting folks come through DC and let us know when you're in DC and we try to have a lunch with our team. You know, Tom Bruce is passing by, come by for lunch. And, and just so people can hear about it, even if it's quote unquote not relevant, it's always relevant. <laughs> you know, and and, and it'll, it'll stimulate something. So we just try to do things like that. Um, you know, I, and, and ultimately it's, it's, it's an ethos of, of risk taking um, which is hard at law firms, I, I realize, <laughs> right? I mean, I remember when, um, and, and we, we, we go well beyond the bar world, but one of the first partners we, we had there was uh, the Virginia State Bar. And when we were looking at that, another company threatened to sue the bar and us in antitrust, because doing a member benefit was clearly a violation of antitrust. No one really knew how. <laughs> but, you, you know, and, and so what, what do you do when you get threatened with, you know, major antitrust litigation? Um, yeah, we looked at it and then decided to ignore it. <laughs> and you, you got to do that, that and, and so we try to have that kind of ethos, which is, again, especially hard for law firms. Um, but I think, you know, and may, anyway, so, so it's a combination of those things. Oh, I, so um, 
I'll, I'll just give a, a, a specific example of something that I found surprising, um, which is which because Hope and Main, as you can see, is a shared use space, so the, that's what makes it affordable for the makers to be there. There's a number of companies working in kitchens together at any one time. And because of the, regular, the food safety regulations, you have to have people doing similar processes. So there's a, you know, a baking kitchen and a processing kitchen and so forth. So you, you, you might have several bakers in the baking kitchen at one time. And you might have several, for example, salsa makers in the processing kitchen. And we act, I think we're up to maybe four or five salsa makers or people who make salsa as part of a whole product line. And you know, at first I was thinking, you know, how's that going to work? Because they would potentially see themselves as in competition with each, with each other. But what we found is that peer collaboration is an incredible source mm -hmm. of innovation. And um, they, don't, they don't fear that the other person's going to imitate them or steal their recipe. In fact, they've learned from the students at the <laughs> startup clinic that you know, if you have a, a trade secret, you're, you're able to protect that in various ways. But, but what's, what's happened is that they're able to riff off of each other and, and just without even you know, creating a, a lot of, uh, you know, without over-engineering it, we've seen tr tremendous innovation that comes from peers that collaborate and, um, and, and each of them has made each other's product um, better. So I, I'm gonna answer the question that you asked and then I'm gonna answer the question that I wanna answer. Um, <laughs> which I think is fair. Uh, so within my organization, I would say we don't really do the best job of, of really fostering innovation. Um, and uh, so that's, that's a takeaway <laughs> that I'm going home with. But I think, I think I would say two things that we do do that I think are smart are um, one, you know, to, to Phil's point about it's hard in certain industries and in certain organizations. I think that's true in, in certain pieces of our work. Failure really isn't an option. Um, there are, you know, some donors you can't screw up their that relationship. Um, you know, there are um, there's certain funding that is really about sustaining uh, and making sure that programs are happening. It's not about taking risks and trying new things. And uh, so to jeopardize that would be to jeopardize, you know, really important services. So there's a certain piece of our work that I think is, is more about execution um, and improvement than it is about innovation. And I think it's really important to, that you think about those things differently and that you ask yourself that because I think we tend to put innovation sometimes on a pedestal like it should be everywhere mm. and it's this, you know, it's, it's above all and um, it's important and it's critical but, you know, it, it's a fact, it has to be factored into everything else. Um, I would say that something we have gotten good at within my organization is ask, figuring out what the questions are, the really important questions that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so we gradually, after banging my head against the wall for a while, realized, wait, we keep, we keep circling around the same issues <laughs> and we're not resolving them. And I found there was incredible power of just articulating what those questions and those issues are. Not so much that they were going to be solved immediately by our board, by our staff, by the community, but even just sort of holding them out there, I think allowed a certain level of creative discussion, um, suggestions, um, small experiments that wouldn't have happened if we just kept kind of like mucking around and not really knowing what we were mucking around with. Um, so I would say we've done that well. And then the last thing is I think, I think probably the best thing we've done is we've, we've allowed it to happen when it's happened. Um, so, you know, the, the thing I really give um, our CEO the most credit for is, you know, there have been some ideas that, that we've had where in hindsight they're just, they're kind of crazy and silly. Uh, and he's, you know, he's let us run with them. Um, and some of them have worked out really well. Some of them have not. Um, and we try to minimize the collateral damage when that happens. But um, I think that, that that's been really important. But uh, the question that I would prefer to answer is, um, or I would have more fun answering, um, is what we do in the community to foster innovation. And um, there, I think there's really two roles that we play. One, obviously, is funding. Um, so certainly we can, and, and in all areas of our work, I think there is a very strong innovation thread. And there actually has been since the foundation's beginning. So we have funded startup nonprofit organizations that now are extremely well established. Um, we have funded startup nonprofits that do not exist. Um, we have funded new programs that have taken off and that have um, 
mm. failed. Uh, and so I think that's an important piece of what we do to allow space for that uh, within the um, within the social sector um, and also within the public sector increasingly. So a lot of the work that we're doing right now um, intersects with government and you know, innovation in government is a whole, I and mean, that would be a really interesting <laughs> uh, discussion and, or panelists to have, because um, I've had a lot of conversations with folks who are new to government who are trying to make change in the public sector that I think is almost set up to with withstand any kind of uh, any kind of change and so we've been thinking a lot about how do how can we support and foster that and have had some really um, good small little uh, experiments I feel like but the big thing and the the most important thing I think we do and Lisa um, already touched on it is just connecting people um, and putting smart people mm -hmm. in the same room to talk about it, and it can be anything really. I mean, I have found it can be common challenges, it can be uh, new opportunities, it can be venting sessions sometimes. I mean, it really is just putting sort of smart people and the, um, I always get it wrong, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Did I get that right? <laughs> I think I got that right this time. Um, I really truly believe that, and I think it depends on who you have in the room because there are certain people who just, that's not the mindset they bring, but there are others who, um, I always say when you get them together, like magic things happen. Um, and on another panel, I actually use the word poof, and I will not <laughs> use that again because it's a legal term. It was, it was not my finest moment. Um, but I, I do really believe that. And so I, I think that, um, that all of us can do that in different ways. Uh, I think it also relates to the question making part that I talked about because if you've got a really strongly crafted problem and you ask people what they think about solving it, you're going to get things out of that. They may or may not be useful, but you can iterate over time. And you also, I think people start to work together in new ways and use different muscles. Um, and so, you know, in my area of, of work and grant making, uh, the economic security area, I have what I consider kind of like a brain trust. Um, I never called you that before, but at least it's part of it. So, uh, where just people that I really trust, I respect their work. Uh, Every time I leave a conversation with them, I come away with some new, like, duh, moment um, that kind of shifts my thinking. And I think that's probably the best feeling um, that we have at work. So those would be my thoughts. Yeah, so a lot of helpful points in there. I think one that I particularly like is the idea that you have to prioritize uh, your innovative ideas and your innovative efforts with everything else that you have and how do you balance that at any given time. Um, and strangely, I was listening to a podcast in the way here about how you ask your audience or your clients questions that get them to tell you what they want because they don't know what they want. And that was their showcase example was the Ford quote um, that if, if he had asked people what they wanted, they probably would have said a better horse or a faster horse. They had no way to think about a car being the answer. So if you ask people what they want, you won't really get a valuable answer. And I don't think I've ever heard that before, and I've now heard it twice in several hours, so that was a bit spooky. <laughs> uh, I'm going to combine the next two questions, actually. They, they go a little bit hand in hand, and I think Jessica's started to answer the first one really well. Uh, does innovation come from, in your experience, the top down, the bottom up? Is it neither? Is it both? And then there are a lot of writings about innovation that talk about the tension that's endemic to an innovative atmosphere. So how do you encourage all your staff members to argue with each other's uh, visions and to disagree with each other without encouraging chaos uh, or discontent at the same time? So how do you tackle that? And then how is that managed in your organization in what direction or combination of directions? You want to start? Let's, we just, I think, got part of an answer from Jessica, so we'll start uh, with Phil and work our way okay. down. Jessica, had anything to add? Well, thank you. Oh, top down, middle, I, I, I think all the above. Um, you, know, you know, there's, and the studies have shown, there's no substitute sometimes for someone who's just incredibly creative um, and very lucky. My co founder, Ed Walters, I'm sure you all know him, he just is, and there's certainly a lot less bureaucracy when the person at the top is <laughs> just has these great ideas and wants to run with them and and so we you know uh, so I think that's part of it but it's certainly uh, it, you know uh, when we had to redo our iPhone app in a certain way one of one of our people just ran with it and did it in the evening said I don't think we got to change it like this they just did it 
And, and so it, it doesn't have to be driven uh, from the top. Um, you know, our data operations, the way we, we built them is because another one of our people who was, um, you know, CFO, pretty close to the top, and uh, it, it just said, um, you know, we can make it better quality and more affordable if we build our own operations in China. And so she did. Um, you know, so where, where does it come from? It can come from anywhere, again, if you don't uh, stop it. And, and very importantly, you know, notwithstanding the Henry Ford uh, comment, um, you guys, and I don't know why I was saying before law firm, law firm, law firm. I know it's not norm, this is mostly law school. But anyway, any law librarian, uh, you, know, you, you know legal research better than anyone. And, you, and you tell us how to do it. You tell us when we need a new feature. And, and so I think a distinction on the, the, that, that Ford concept, if you, sometimes you can't expect anyone to just come up with, well, here's something no one's ever thought of before. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But people come to you with a need they actually really have. <laughs> and that's, that's fantastic. And, and, and so that, that helps a lot, and that leads to a lot of innovation. So, um, and so, you know, on the question about the, the second part, about the creative tension and how do you have the arguing and the, it, with, without chaos or discontent, I actually think you, you never get discontent from the arguing. You get this, people are, are not happy when they can't say what they think, when they don't have a voice. If you let them have a voice and argue and and everyone knows they're not going to win all the time, <laughs> but but just to be heard, I think makes a big difference. So I think I think that actually helps. Um, and and how do we, you know how do we how do we do that? We we don't have a lot of hierarchy. In, you know, it's if you have an idea, uh, for people are 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 easily collaborating. That you know we have cubes. Uh, if you have an idea, it's not uh, oh let's set up an appointment for two weeks from today and talk about it. Just, just walk over, just call. You know that kind of thing helps helps so much. I think creating that that culture, um, and uh, and I think also uh, what what did it. You know I think people see Ed and I disagree about things you know, all the time. We often used to say that if, you know, if, if we both agree, we know it's wrong. Uh, and, and so, and so we, we, have, we have that. And you know, some of the examples, uh, big and small, um, should, the, should our apps be free? And of course they are. And it's been so important. Um, you know, I, we, we argued about that. I don't think I was on the right side of that. Originally I thought it might be too much cannibalizing, too much, you know, the arguments you might think. But that's okay. We argue. Eventually, says, oh, "Let's try it." And um, another example, you all probably know the um, "Kiss My App" T-shirt, right? Everyone loves the "Kiss My App" T-shirt. There were a couple people at the company who felt adamantly um, it was just a little too disrespectful, too inappropriate. You know, we can't go there. Um, yeah, we all we talked about it. We did it. Uh, and, and I think that's how, the, how everyone else has reacted. Most people love it, and a few people are like, that's OK. <laughs> and so you, know, you, you, you try. So, um, um, and a big, and the last point I'll make on, on, on sort of the second question is, is um, and this is very hard in law schools or, or law firms or you know, in so many places operate where if there, if there are disagreements, everyone has a veto. Right, uh, you know, every professor has to be on board. Every partner has to be on board, which guarantees you will do nothing interesting. If 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 everyone gets a veto, you gotta have, you gotta have, and, and I think the libraries can play a really big role in being a little outside of that culture, and being the you know how we're the experts on where the world is really going, and you know we gotta go do this without getting everyone on board before you start pushing it and, and popularizing it. I like, I like that point because, um, you know, people get very confused about what consensus is, and it doesn't mean that everybody agrees. It, the, I find the best definition of consensus is, can we all live with this? And if you really can't live with this, raise your hand. When I'm, you know, working with groups, it's mm -hmm. one of the questions I like to ask because, it's different than do we all agree because that's that's kind of a you know, it's like a crazy question um, and also in, in an innovation environment where you're talking about you know 
um, teams of rivals, you know, the Lincoln model mm -hmm. of, a, of, a, of, a, of a team of, of rivals. You know, a team of rivals can go in a lot of directions. I mean, in our, our own government is set up to be, a, you know, a team of rivals. And, you know, at, at best it's, you know, chaos, at worst it's gridlock, but we don't seem to get anything, you know, better than that. So how do, you know, how do organizations that embrace that philosophy get, you know, sort of get beyond gridlock and, 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 and chaos? And, and, and one of the things I think is very valuable is, is the convening role, is, the, is, is what a Rhode Island Foundation does or what your professional association does because, because sometimes organizations can't get past that and they, and they need to bring ideas sort of outside to that, you know, to that neutral space where you don't have literally the, po the organizational politics. Because I also think innovation is um, is a beauty contest, and voices aren't heard if they're not the people that are you know that you typically listen to in an organization. And um, you know the best leaders are, are people that really do you know understand that 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 there are you know that 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 there are people in their organization they have to find a way to give a voice to because they're not necessarily people that speak up in meetings. They're not the people that. You know, they hear from all the time. They're not necessarily even ambitious people. So, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, need for for organizational, you know, in, intelligence. And most leaders, sort of, the, the sort of prototypical leader will 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 sort of will telegraph that it's it's not okay to make mistakes. It's you know, it's not okay to disagree with me. And all of a sudden, they sort of shut down everything, and they don't, you know, they don't. They only want to hear good news. So. So I think there's a, a lot of things, um, you know, that, that come to play with organizational politics, organizational behavior, where a professional association can be so helpful. I think libraries are under incredible pressure to innovate. I, I, I am on the board of the Rogers Free Library in Bristol. I also have led the fundraising effort for the library learning commons on this campus, not, not the library in the law school, but the other one. And, um, for the university, and I, I've just never seen a place that is being asked to, you know, move at the speed of light in, ch in changing what you do and how you do it. Um, I, I don't know how you do it. I mean, I'm, I'm so impressed with what libraries are faced with these days, and um, you have a tremendous need to innovate. <laughs> I second what all, all of what they said. Yeah, thank you so, so much. <laughs> I'm on board. That one. Um, so then I'll move on to um, how do you suggest balancing the patience that you need to support your the employees and the innovators on the one hand with the urgency that you need to show results or be competitive in the marketplace on the other hand. I feel like we've heard some idea, ideas, you know, you talk about a veto system to make sure things get done. Um, Jessica's talking about balancing innovation priorities with other, other priorities and uh, Lisa's talked about creating uh, or, or separating yourself into a neutral environment, um, have that mechanism in place. So I feel like we've heard some ideas. Does anybody want to add more on that point? I just want to say, I think this is the best question mm -hmm. ever. Um, this is the this is the question, and um, I personally am terrible at this, so <laughs> um, I think it's really, really hard. I actually don't think any one person can do this alone. I think this is where uh, your organizational culture and structure has to come up, um, because um, you know I know I certainly lean on the urgent, impatient side, and I need people around me who can sort of create a little bit more of a safe, um, comfortable spot. Um, and I've certainly been in organizations where I've seen that dynamic play out too. But the only other thing I would say is I actually don't think it's supposed to be comfortable. Um, I think a little bit of discomfort is okay, depending on where it comes from. I think there's discontent that comes from exactly what they hit on, which is we keep having the same conversation, we're not moving forward, and I don't know what the rules are for how we're going to move forward. Um, which is, I think, really so much more frustrating than, okay, I thought we should have done something different, but a decision was made and we're going forward over here, which I generally think most people can live with unless it's a real, you know, huge philosophical um, difference, which certainly those come up. But most of the time, those aren't what I see. Um, so I think it's really important that the, the sort of norms of the group um, and the decision making are set. Um, not that they can't ever be changed, but that people understand here's the rules that we're going to play by. Um, but I also think, you know, there's, there's a great book um, by, um, I 
I think it's Heifetz and Linsky out of Harvard about change and transformation. And they give this example of um, like a, a pot boiling and how you have to keep it at like the right temperature so it's still boiling but it's not overflowing. I don't cook so I think that's how it works. Um, and I think that's a really important point of like you've got to make it a little bit uncomfortable otherwise no, nothing's going to change. There's no reason to. Um, but you don't want it to overflow and cause complete chaos. Um, and so, you know, what's the right temperature and, and how do you think about like creating that space and container for it? And, and also, you know, recognizing the situation where, you know, nine women can't make a baby in a month. You know, there are some <laughs> things that just take time. You, you can't just, you know, you know, there's some things you just can't throw a lot of resources at and expect that this is, you know, this is going to happen. And, and, um, and I think a really, you know, a really wise leader sees the things that need to take time because that is going to be the best result. Mm. You, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it, yeah, it's knowing what's going to take time and a, 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 allow a leader that's willing to take the long view and yeah. say this is going to take time because it should be a false choice. You know, if the world operated, you know, properly, right? I mean, having really inspired employees who are innovating, I mean, that's going to lead to the best result, and you, you never should make this choice unless, you know, you have to care about quarterly results. Um, and, and we're fortunate that we're not, we're not public to a large degree. We don't care that much about quarterly results. We, we, mm -hmm. we know it's, it's, it's where is this going to be in, in a year, but most people don't get that luxury, so it's, it's very unfortunate. Um, but I think, um, you know, one possibility that I know bigger companies have, have done is the Skunk Works mm -hmm. idea, uh, that if most of the organization is going to be completely driven by, by the uh, financials every quarter, create a little subdivision, have, have a little small company <laughs> um, that is exempted from all that and, and let them play. Um, and it's, it's worked really well for some of the largest corporations in America. So I think, I think we all can do it to some, <laughs> to some degree. Can I just add one thing? I probably am screwing up all of your questions, but um, I just thought that was such an important point about the public aspect because I think for most of us there is a public component of what we do and that's often the hardest part. So I think of Lisa when she came out with the idea of we're going to take this 100 year old school and we're going to turn it into a shared kitchen facility and we're going to do it with a grant from the USDA in Warren and you know a lot of people were like, hmm. Okay, <laughs> um, and it takes, I think it's one thing to do it within your organization, it's a whole different thing when you've got outside people watching you. And it just, you just have, somebody has to be brave enough to take that and to hold it and to be able to move forward with it. So I think of people like her, I think of we have now um, eight innovation fellows and we get them together every once in a while and I think the so these, these are folks who are given $300,000 over three years to implement some idea, um, innovative idea for improving Rhode Island. And you know it ranges from like curing um, hep C in Rhode Island to implementing design thinking in schools, all kinds of things. And every single time we get them together, the biggest thing that comes up is that, that role of you know, being a transformational leader requiring self-transformation in order to do that and having a whole lot of people looking at you and like you know lobbing their expectations and judgment up against you and really what I have found is and what I think our role is just trying to support them in doing that um, and I think that's kind of our role at the foundation more broadly because it's it's hard and it's it takes time everything takes longer than people think it's going to um, and there's no, I find there's no, there's point in time judgments, but things evolve. And some, you know, it just really requires being sort of courageous and, and being willing to kind of stand up and let things um, evolve and, and take what, what comes. I think that's a really great point and something that's worth recognizing. So innovation does require a lot of bravery and dedication and hard work. And that's an important takeaway for this audience because lawyers are nothing if not risk averse, right? Some of us by training, some of us by nature and training. So it can be a difficult environment to get that started. Uh, 
According to the, the same book we mentioned earlier, Collective Genius, leaders face two basic challenges when they're creating an organization, or one is creating an organization where people are willing to face the hard work that Jessica's talking about, the tension and the stress of innovation, and then secondly, creating an organization where people are able to do the work that it requires. So in other words, the leaders have to build and sustain that innovative environment. So we started talking about this, but can you touch on what you have found to be any other successful ways to build or sustain that environment. Um, you know, Phil's mentioned maybe you have a subset of people that are responsible for innovation and maybe they come up with ideas themselves or maybe they're the ones that are responsible for pushing other people on the team that are, uh, you know, less inclined to, to think in that way. So is there anything else that people want to add on that? I think you ask. We've covered, we, huh? I think just ask, you know, I think having a door always open, whether it's a, there's a separate subset that's responsible for it or not, but um, knowing that there's an opportunity for input and just and asking and knowing that, you know, 99% of what you hear is going to be perhaps not something that's immediately useful, but you might get something really good. Yeah, I, I, I'd say nothing builds the environment more than the people. Hire inspired, passionate people who, you know, in our case, for some, you know, just really care about legal research. You, you, you know, right? I mean, this is a crowd where we all do. Uh, but it's not the norm in the world. <laughs> and, uh, and you find, and you find uh, those people, even if they're not, um, if, if they just think, wow, what's happening in, in analytics is, and data is so exciting, and that's just what they want to be a part of. They're going to have that inspiration. And I also talked to um, a gentleman at, at IBM who's kind of in charge of the innovation team with the, with the Watson group and asked him, you know, what, and, and this was his, one of his absolute key points was it's, it's about getting the right people who, who just will keep the, because uh, you can't teach passion or caring. <laughs> and, uh, and so you find those folks, hopefully. And, and the other thing is just, you know, there's something to be said for believing you can do something that's impossible. And I often think we, we're losing this as a culture uh, overall. Um, there's a story uh, I hope and believe is true, at least I've been told it's true, from I, I think it was Princeton or anyway, some, some as a math department, right? And, and, uh, and a student comes in late to class, copies down the problem set, you know, four problems, whatever, goes home, solves one of them wasn't the problem set. The professor was saying, well, these are four of the, you know, completely undoable, unsolved major problems. You can't just do that in a, in a week. Well, if, maybe you can if you actually believe it is solvable. Uh, <laughs> and so, and, and so if, if, if you just, if you, to whatever you can do to build that ethos of, uh, yeah, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we'll find, we'll find a way. <laughs> and, uh, and then sometimes people believe it. Right. It's like that suspension of, of disbelief in an idea, you know, in, in team meetings and you say, let's just, you know, throw out ideas and let's just hold them for a minute and let's all pretend yeah. like this is going to work. Like, what would that look like if this yeah. really, you know, if this really worked? And I think, you know, investing in people too, not just supporting them, but investing in them. I think people need professional mm -hmm. development. And again, mm -hmm. I look at this group of people that is so challenged with what they, with the task that is ahead of them. and. And um, it, you know you you have to invest in people and realize how fast technology is changing. How fast you know you just can't by osmosis absorb all of that. I think I think you have to be willing to to put the resources out there to invest in staff for sure. Um, I think that the expectations is a really important point too. I was talking to some people at the law school here the other day about that. What role does our expectations of others? Uh, play in their success and there's a lot of great research now talking about the difference that it actually makes uh, between two different people similarly situated when one has different expectations than the other. So a fun question, can you talk about the role that failure plays in an innovative organization? Yeah. Right. We have to assume some, that not every idea, idea is going to work. So can you talk about My your experience subject. with failure? I consider myself <laughs> an expert. <laughs> Because I really believe that getting it wrong is the first step to getting it right. And I, I it's so, I, you have to, you have, 
Life is just the is just the culmination of failure. That's what it is. Like every moment, the moment that we're in right now is the sum total of all the things you have failed at. I I, I thoroughly believe that, and. And we just don't ever, it's like this thing that we can't talk about in our culture. It's almost, you know, it's like the F word or something like that. You know, we just, it is the F word. It's the new F word, I guess, I thought about it. But failure is, it's critically important. And when people, I mean, it's critically important in education. It's critically important in a, in a, in a startup environment. And that was the absolute basis of Hope and Maine is because we, you, you have to understand that people need time and space to fail when you're a business startup and when you're in a very expensive business like food where the infrastructure is expensive the, the, the you know you can't food you can't go develop food a food business is like developing an app in your garage i mean you've got to be in a in a code compliant environment you you know you have to either build the kitchen rent the kitchen uh, you know make this huge investment and if you make a decision and and all of a sudden you, that was a bad decision and you're going down this bad path that everything ends and you've mortgaged your house and that's not a good, you know, that's not good for the economy. So we wanted to stimulate this environment or, and create this environment where people can fail fast and move on, you know. So I, I, a great example was a, was a, was a professional chef from um, Johnson & Wales and, and he's been there m many years, you know, he's a pro and he had a chocolate business and he started off going in one direction with this business. So they named after a dead uncle. It was like not a great brand, but you know the product was good, but the brand wasn't catching on. And fortunately, he didn't make the investment in the direction that he was going, because he ended up scrapping the whole thing and moving in a in like 180 degree different direction. But fortunately, she, he's just renting a kitchen, and so he didn't. He had no. He it was easy for him to take that risk, and you know I think the point about about it being so public when you when you start something it's so it's so public and um we have to be we have to be in it with the person you know who's who's doing that and not sort of you know sitting out there like a reality show and waiting for you know the contestant that gets voted off the island because we're just this culture of of you know failure's not okay and it, we, we have to make it more than okay, we actually have to encourage it because people have to realize that there's life after failure and it's actually a better life. It's a better life after you have failed. I'm gonna just jump in very briefly because there were so many great things in there. So one is creating the environment, going back to the previous question, in which failure is an option, right? Understanding that not every idea is gonna work out. Um, also, uh, the timing of the failure can be very important, right? How do you know when to let go of an idea when it's really not going to work? That's a really difficult thing to grasp. And uh, Lisa mentioned my students have been into her organization before to do presentations on legal topics, right? So that brings to mind for me, what do you not want the reason for failure to be, right? So we don't want to see struggling businesses that are not succeeding because they got tripped up in what is really a basic legal problem. Um, I, I just completely agree with that, and I think from a li library point of view, um, so I'm not a lawyer, but uh, I am a big library dork, um, and I think of them as safe spaces, and I, so I, I think like a lot of what we're talking about, you all have an opportunity to sort of create that, that place where learning and experimentation and you know, things happen before they go out and happen public, shiny, you know, in the real world, and I think that's such a great um, opportunity and also uh, responsibility that comes with that. And the other thing I would say is I actually have, so I, my issue is with the word failure because I hate talking about success and failure because I think it's just so, um, it's so black and white and, and very few things, maybe in sort of the product world where you yeah. launch something and, and people don't like it and don't use it, that, that's different. But in the community change world, it's just, that's not how it really works. It's so, it's so much more iterative. And something I might say right now is a failure because it's not working, it might just take, you know, it's going to take some time and in eight months we're, we're going to hold it up as a success. Something that we might hold up as a success today in eight months could be on the front page of the Providence Journal because it, there's been some, you know, major disaster around it. So I just think time plays such a role in how we consider things success right. and yes, failure. 
And then the last thing I want to say is I just so agree with Lisa's point about the reality show. Like I, I think we now have this culture of almost like entertainment of watching people fail and and I hate it because mm -hmm. I think um, you know there's this uh, author um, Brene Brown who has this quote about you know the, the Roosevelt quote about being in the arena and she has this quote that is if you're not also in the arena getting your ass kicked I'm not interested in your feedback yeah. and I, I have this quote <laughs> I have it pasted to my computer and my bathroom mirror um, and it's in my wallet because I just think it's so important that everyone's you know everyone's feedback and opinion is not equal and the people who are going to sit back on their couch and you know make this and with a bowl of popcorn whatever but the people who are you know out there yeah, with you so trying to make things different and trying to make things happen those are those are the people you want to engage with you want to support them um, I think I went off on a segue, but it's it's a little bit of a... <laughs> no, I love that perspective, and I also like that. If, if, if something doesn't work out, you're not failing. You're just ahead of your time, right? That's a fantastic takeaway. I like that. And um, I, I just say, you know, when, when people say, why is the U.S. typically leading the world in innovation? You know, why, why do we have Silicon Valley? Folks often point to our bankruptcy system, right? You, you can try and fail and there's no huge stigma and your life isn't permanently destroyed uh, and that's true for the person and for the company and you never you know it's again so you feel awkward talking about that but that that's how it's supposed to work uh, and, it, and it does work and um, uh, then um, there was a uh, program at the PLL summit, which I realize probably most of you didn't, didn't get to because it, it wasn't not a lot of law school folks there, but there was, I believe, a Wharton professor who did a, a workshop on innovation, and they had done studies of, you know, in the class, to follow, everyone has, you know, 20, 30 ideas, and what looks good, and the next stage, what looks good, and the next stage, what looks good, and what finally turns out to be pretty good. It's often you know, idea number two or four of the first rankings who that, turn, that turns out to be good. So if you didn't try four of them and have three of them not work out so well, you never would have gotten to the good one. The one that looked best in the beginning was not the one that ended up the best, and it's just the way it is. <laughs> so, so, uh, so that, and, and then finally, and I guess, you know, the, the role of the, of the library again, um, Ed, 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 my co-founder, you know, he likes to say data is the new oil, right? In the old days, you, you had the wild catters who would run out and try to do a well, and some of them just went bankrupt, and some did really great, and, but they, they were the innovators. And so who, who are the wild catters? Who can be the wild catters today? And it's, it's, it's you guys, right? Because you, you have the data, and you, and you have to unfortunately stick your head up a little, a little bit, right? Because the, the, most of the, the professors and the, uh, and, and, and the partners and whatever it is, they're, they're not going to, they don't want to, they're trained not to. <laughs> but, but in this room, we can. And, and with access to things no one else really knows about or is thinking about. <laughs> So, um, so there's really some nice opportunity with a little will, you know, willingness to, to, to publicize, hey, we're trying this, and sometimes it won't work. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I did not. Uh, oh, sorry. Do you mind if we take an interim question? Are you okay with that? <laughs> just briefly, like, please. Oh, <laughs> Yes. 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 Yes.
space. So I, I think that the two go hand in hand. Yeah, I think that's actually uh, a great transition into our next question. So I promise that was not a, a plant that was done on purpose. But the, <laughs> the next question is, what role does a shared sense of uh, purpose or values of an organization play in encouraging innovation? So if the problem that you're having is the viewpoint of the organization, then in your organization, how does that shared sense of purpose or value system play into encouraging innovation? And I would add maybe even do any of you have innovation included as part of your strategic plan? And does your organization have a strategic plan? If so, is that helping you as well? Well, I think it's such a great question. I actually, um, the foundation convenes a group of eight industry associations. So these are folks like the Manuf Rhode Island Manufacturers mm -hmm. Association, Marine Trades Association, Defense Association. Um, and they are struggling with the exact same thing that you were talking about. Um, and it, it, our program is a capacity building program. So we look at it less as at the programmatic um, you know, what they're doing and more as their organizational health and how we can help support that. And the biggest key from that perspective that I've seen is, is really supporting them as, as people. And I really, I, I know it sounds hokey, but it comes back to that bravery thing because they are, you all are in a position of responding to the needs of your clients or your users and positioning your institution for the future. And sometimes those are completely, you know, different mm -hmm. directions. And I think that is really hard uh, emotionally and mentally, much less just time. Like, how do you even spread your time across that? Um, so, the supporting you all in like the personal growth and um, courage that it takes to do that, I think is really important. And in, again, it kind of sounds a little bit like a cop out answer, but I do believe it. I also believe in allies um, and and maybe being a little um, Machiavellian in terms of how you how you mount an opposition campaign, because I totally hear you on the maniacal people, um, and they can be overwhelming, and I think you have to be fairly ruthless in, um, you all know you're not alone, and um, you're not just making this stuff up, and so um, you know, find the people who can be your allies and be your cheerleaders, and um, you know, be, I think, fairly strategic in terms of trying to build support for that. We do have innovation in our strategic plan, uh, it's interesting because I never really thought about before, like, does that matter? I mean, it matters. Of course it matters. I can't say I go back to it every single day. Where it has been helpful is when the maniacal forces are sort of pushing back on it to be able to go back and say, hey, wait a second, you approved this <laughs> and this is in here. And I think, um, and, and because it gives you permission, I yeah. think, in a way. Um, and so if you're able to get some sort of, uh, if you're able to get some permission, even if it's only this much and you can stretch it into that much, um, I feel like it's key. I don't, I don't know if those are at all answers to the question. I think that's helpful. If you can get a, if you can get a chance to participate in your uh, overarching organization strategic plan, right, make sure you get the library in there because a lot of different law schools and law firms and other organizations are looking for some ways to be innovative, so make sure you're a part of that. Um, pa uh, comments from others on that? Point. Yeah. If, um, you know, the shared mission, it's, it, it can be really helpful, again, especially to your question. Uh, if there's a shared direction, then it, it, it makes it so much easier, or at least it creates a possibility. You can make it this other person's idea and like, oh, now I so agree with you that this is the <laughs> key problem and where we need to go. We all agree that this is what we're trying to solve. And, and you know, so how, how, how should we do that? And, and oh, he, you know, we could, and, and, and kind of uh, make it um, not something that you want to do just because it makes a lot of sense, but you're helping them solve their problem because they were so brilliant in the first place to set that direction. <laughs> and and it, it's, a, it's a little Machiavellian in, yeah. a, in a way, but you know, I, I wonder uh, some, Sometimes, and, and sometimes, you know, I think of our strategic plan or just, you know, specifying what are the questions and problems we're trying to solve. If everyone's thinking of the same stuff, um, it, it gets the innovation aligned and gets, it, it and does prevent some of those, those barriers. Uh, but it doesn't, I'm sure it doesn't really make it easy because if someone's dug in, yes, I agree with this, but your solution is just wrong because I'm, I know more about libraries than you do. <laughs> I do. I, I like that complimentary approach. I think that would probably work very well in the law firm environment. Some of you would probably agree. 
Uh, Lisa, did you want to add anything on well, that? Well, you know, I, I go back and forth between these different worlds. So I, I work, you know, I'm working with a very small nascent nonprofit, and then I'm, you know, here in this big behemoth, you know, place, and, and always thinking about how you can be an entrepreneur. You know, how you mm -hmm. can, how you can get, you know, small wins. I, I love to say we're all in this alone. You know, people are like, what are you talking about? You know, but but sometimes you realize that that um, you know there there are. You know, there are people you can entrepreneur with, and I like to say, go where the energy is, even in a big organization. You know, find some like-minded people, um, because that's going to be the, you know, the group that, that you know, can, can get some things done. And don't sort of look at this as a big, you know, let's, we have to eat this elephant in one bite. You know, and change, all, you know, so often feels like that. So I, I always encourage my staff here to, you know, in, be an entrepreneur. Find the places, even if it's on the fringes of where, you know, where you see change and where you see energy. And, and, and I think my, my other point, and I'm just so fortunate to be able to do this, is, you know, I know that the future is not a longer version of the present, right? And, 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 and partly why I know that is I, I actually came into higher ed from, from healthcare. And if you want to see the future of higher ed, go look at healthcare, and it's not pretty. <laughs> you know, you can show people, you can, there's actually other industries where you can both show people the doomsday scenario and some, you know, some other options. And actually, it's very liberating to take the, another industry as an example because it, it, it kind of t takes all of the politics out of it. So, and I know the Rhode Island Foundation does this all the time, where, you know, where, where you can look to other industries that have successfully innovated in data and library science and, you know, whatever, and, and do a field trip and bring some of those, you know, bring some folks on a field trip, both some of your allies and some of the people that you know are the, the folks that are just going to be dead set against this. And, you know, let them, let their conclusions reach them because when you when you can see that that you know the future is not a longer version of the present and this this is where things are going but here's here's some people who solved it and and it's really refreshing to get outside your industry and i'm so fortunate to be able to do that all the time all right we're going to sort of combine two of our next questions which are on the same theme of teams versus individuals uh, so uh, research, research shows that, or at least some research shows, that groups tend to be less creative than individuals and that innovators have a great need to be autonomous. Um, so the question for you is how do you suppo support autonomy and teamwork and then does innovation come primarily from an individual uh, or the organization? And if it's the individual, how do you get the rest of your team to work with you? And I think some of you have touched on that, um, you know, Lisa just commented on different, building different teams maybe that are not just the obvious team within your organization. Uh, I think we've had a lot of great comments on that. So I would ask, so we have time for questions if the panel wouldn't mind giving their literal 30-second uh, wisdom if there's anything else you want to add on that point. We feel we covered it for some people. Yeah. Phil uh, wants to add. 30, no, 30 seconds. Um, the key, it's, it's from the individual. I think you do need the brainstorming, and I don't, I don't know. So I, I like the groups more than just individual. And the key, whether it's the individual or the organization, I, I think so often the role of the organization is just to get out of the way. Mm. That's a great point. <laughs> and I also like when you're building those teams, uh, Jessica's takeaway of building a, an atmosphere of discontent versus discomfort, right? That those are different things and one is helpful and one is not. That was a really important point. The, um, with with teams, teams versus individuals, I used to do this exercise as groups of people and just randomly break them into, you know, groups of 10. And I would have this list of the top 10, you know, candy bars. And I would say, at your place, you individually write down what you think the top 10 candy bars are, and then as a group, come up with the top 10 list. I did that over and over again, and I don't have one example where one person ever did a better job than their group. It just, just never happened, because there is mm. this collective wisdom in groups. The problem is groups don't know how to get at it. They don't, they don't have the skills, they don't have the organizational you know, dynamics or culture to get at the collective wisdom of the group. A group is always smarter. 
you know, and that's why human beings are, are social beings, because somebody understood that we have a better chance of solving problems and surviving as a group than we do as individuals. And that is, I think, our real challenge. Yeah, that's a great point. There is research showing recently that groups are actually often right. Even when they're just guessing a factor figure blindly, usually the group as a whole comes incredibly close. So we do have time for uh, one or two questions from the audience. We have a microphone that will be available that we will hopefully be available that we bring around to you. Or, or you can just yell and I will repeat the question for everyone in the back. Right, so for anyone who didn't hear that, re innovation can be challenging when you don't have enough resources, right? So if you don't have the funds to allocate to innovation, how can you still have that innovative uh, spark? Yeah, I, I, I guess I just don't believe that, that paradigm. I think that innovation is, is, is working with what you have to solve a problem. And, and so, so it does, it's not, it, I think it's a false paradigm to think you have to have more to innovate. I think actually some of the most, the greatest innovations come, from, again, kind of from sometimes a point of desperation where you do have less and you realize you still have to solve that problem with the resources that you have. I'm not trying to, you know, throw a wet blanket on what you're saying, but, you know, look at, there's not, I don't think there's going to be more, I don't think there's going to be more resources in education. I see less resources. I saw less resources in healthcare. And so that's where innovation comes from. Where, where are you not thinking of that's out there that, you know, is, is going to solve this problem? And, and it's, like I said, it's not always about throwing suitcases of money at things. It, it just isn't, I think. And that's where so many people just give up and say, oh, we, we just, if we only had more money, if we only had more resources, I don't think it's true. But yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Uh, innovation is largely thinking, right? And so maybe at the worst case, you need time to think it through. But sometimes you don't even need that because the idea of your brain having this back burner and sleeping on it and those sorts of concepts are actually true if you look at neuroscience. So sometimes the great ideas are going to happen in the car or the shower while you're walking the dog. So sometimes you don't even need time or money to come up with great ideas, which is a wonderful thing. Right. I mean, look at MacGyver. Like, he's always, like, right at the end. Like, he never really had what he needed, but he figured it out. You know? Or Buffy the Vampire Slayer for people who are like other genres of resourceful heroes. Myself. <laughs> uh, we do, I think we can do at least one more question. Yes. Well, oh, and here, we have, the, is, we have the mic on its way to you. Sorry. Yes, this is sort of on uh, Jessica's theme of balancing innovation, sort of the old with the innovation. So if anybody on the panel wants to comment, or if anybody in the audience wants to comment on that specific issue from the library perspective. Well, I would love to comment, um, not from the library perspective, but actually one of our other principles in our strategic plan, as well as innovation, is balance, because exactly what you say. So we have, we have to balance donors and nonprofits. We have to balance um, all different sectors, the arts and the economy and healthcare. Um, we, we have donors who uh, don't have email, and then we have donors who want to log in to some program and check their fund balance every three minutes. And so we are constantly, and it's very hard to say no to any of those things when you're a community foundation that serves a state, uh, you know, it's, and there are not many other institutional funders in the community. I have a very hard time saying, no, we can't get into this, we can't work on this problem because we're, you know, we're over here. Um, so balance is a personal struggle for me. And I actually think, uh, 
I think it's hard because I think when you are straddling and when you are trying to do all these things at once, it's very hard to free up the space and the resources. Um, so I agree that you don't always need new resources, but you do sometimes need to channel, whether it's not even financial resources, but just time and attention towards other things. Um, and so I do, I agree that it can be really hard. I think it can be a barrier to innovation. I think that you can sometimes do it in small ways. And so, um, and that's really to your question as well. I think sometimes people think innovation, and I, we, we see this all the time, is they need a million dollars because they got a brilliant idea and they got to go out and they got to implement it up here. When you could do it down here and actually get a lot of traction really quickly, get a huge amount of attention, um, and really start to shift the conversation. So I actually think. The, what I give Lisa the most credit for, and I give her credit for many things, <laughs> including making that project work, but Hope and Maine absolutely shifted the entire conversation in the state around the food industry. So before it was like, yes, we have nice restaurants because we have Johnson Wales, and that's great, and isn't that nice, but you know, it's not an economic driver. To now, food is at the top of the list from everyone who's making all the decisions as an economic driver for Rhode Island. And I think if Hope and Maine didn't happen, that would never, have happened. Um, and so you've got to look at what your levers are. And it's not always, I think, um, scale of implementation. I think sometimes a very small pilot can actually give you the tools that you need to, to, to allow you not to have to balance as much. Um, but mostly I just feel your pain on that because it is really, really Sorry. hard. And it comes down to time. And that's the hardest thing in the world because you can't get more of it. Yeah, that's really helpful. So you all can walk away and make sure you shift the conversation to the library, right? And I'm going to call it there not only because we're out of time, but because the, the concept of balancing these competing interests is a fantastic way to end because that is uh, what it's going to be all about in the end. So thank you very much, everyone, and thank you so much to our panelists.